Good afternoon. My name is Claire Miller, and on behalf of the Friends of the Johns Hopkins University Libraries, welcome to our first Lunch with the Libraries of 2024. This ongoing speaker series spotlights the unique collections, pioneering initiatives, and outstanding staff of the Sheridan Libraries. We are happy that so many people are joining us today for this virtual 150th birthday celebration of Gertrude Stein. Following the presentation, I encourage you to ask questions of our speakers in the chat room. We will do our best to respond to as many questions as we can. Formed in 1931, the Friends of the Johns Hopkins University Libraries is one of the oldest university library support groups in the United States. We provide financial support and advocacy for the Sheridan Libraries and organize events like this one to bring members of the campus and the wider community to the libraries. The friends include people like you, alumni, faculty, staff, students, parents, and community members. I encourage you to join us if you are not already a friend to help ensure that the libraries remain one of the university's strongest assets, the heart of the intellectual life of Hopkins. It is now my very great pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Gabrielle Dean is the William Meyer Curator of Rare Books and Manuscripts in the Sheridan Libraries. She's also an adjunct professor for the Department of English and the program in Museums and Society. She is the lead curator of a new exhibition about Gertrude Stein that will open at the George Peabody Library in September 2024. Gabrielle is joined by three students today, Lizzie Stamper, Alice Robertson, and Jolie Garcia. We are happy to have these students here today for the first time on Lunch with the Libraries. They are an important reminder of the communities the libraries serve. All their bios can be found on the registration page for the, our event today. Thank you, Gabrielle, Lizzie, Alice, and Jolie for joining us today. Thanks, Claire, and thanks to all of you in the audience for joining us today to celebrate the 150th birthday of Gertrude Stein. I'm Gabrielle Dean, and Claire already gave me a nice intro, so um, I'm just going to tell you about an undergraduate course on Gertrude Stein that I taught last semester in which students worked directly with the Robert A. Wilson collection of Gertrude Stein materials, which is a really wonderful, rich collection of rare books, manuscripts, photographs, and lots and lots of cool ephemera, all by and about Gertrude Stein. So for their final projects, students created many exhibits from the collection, and today we're getting to see the fruits of their research. Each student focused on a literary work by Stein, examining its early publication, but also later iterations of that work, a new edition, a translation, an adaptation, um, and maybe a souvenir of a public event or a keepsake um, commemorating that work. Um, looking not only at their work itself, they, but all of these sort of later sort of interpretations their many exhibits really illuminate Stein's literary ambitions, but also her posthumous reputation, how we see and understand her now. I'm going to introduce the three of them again in a moment, but first let me say a few words about our class, our subject Gertrude Stein, and the Hopkins alum who made it all possible, Robert A. Wilson. All right, so this is this is us last semester, um, and you can see what a typical class looked like in this picture. We've got a big cart of boxes. That's the archival part of the collection. And we've got a cart um, of rare books. And that's that's Alice kind of hidden behind the cart of rare books. Um, and a lot of materials set up on tables. Our class was oriented towards the really interesting dilemmas presented by Gertrude Stein in terms of who she was and her legacy. So her pioneering life as a woman and a queer person, 
um, her status as a modernist artist and the celebrity she came to acquire later in life and after her death. The rare materials were our guides for understanding those aspects of her work and life with the aim ultimately of describing and showing these dilemmas to others, hence the curating Gertrude Stein part of our title. So you probably know something about Stein or you wouldn't be here today, but I'll just mention a few things that are relevant to the presentations. Um, she was raised mostly in Europe and California, but her family had roots here in Baltimore. So she came back here for graduate school to attend Johns Hopkins Medical School um, in one of the first classes that admit women actually. She did not graduate. Um, there's probably several, several reasons for that, but she did love studying psychology and it made a deep impression on her in ways that are reflected um, in her work in lots of ways. Uh, she was really interested in sort of human consciousness and perceptions and also unconscious behavior. She moved to Paris with her older brother in 1903, and they started hosting salons at their home and buying a lot of very underappreciated art by artists whose names are now world-renowned, like Picasso, um, Cezanne. Um, and in 1907, she met another young American woman uh, who was visiting Paris, also Californian, also Jewish, and they fell in love. Um, that was Alice B. Toklas, of course. So they made a life together uh, in Paris, and along with their friendships with this incredible, you know, set of innovative artist friends, um, Stein started to become a, a more courageous and experimental writer. She had started off, you know, in a kind of realist mode, uh, but she became a, a lot more interested, like a lot of other writers of her time, in challenging and changing the sort of easy and familiar ways that we use language. Um, of course, that those techniques were very interesting to other writers, not so much always uh, for other readers, and she often struggled to get published and read. This means that her status as a modernist figure is a bit contradictory. So on one hand, she was well-known, well-connected, kind of at the center of these really important movements in literature and art. But on the other hand, you know, her, her work was sometimes depreciated, uh, made fun of by reviewers, and she had a hard time finding publishers. In class, we also looked at the interesting, I wanna say con inconsistencies um, of her life. She was highly educated and independent for a woman of her time, and she lived openly with the woman she considered her, her wife. But she expressed no interest in the political fight for women's rights, and sometimes she kind of even made fun of it a little bit. Um, and working openly for LGBTQ equality was pretty much impossible during her lifetime. That said, the last major work of her life was the libretto for an opera about the suffragist Susan B. Anthony, uh, that's the mother of us all. And that work begins and ends with domestic scenes between Susan B. Anthony and her companion, Anne. You know, it's a lot, right, going on. It doesn't always cohere into a single narrative. Gertrude Stein was a complicated person. So to understand the trajectory of Stein's work in life, we read The Delightful. Uh, this is the one book I would strongly recommend if you haven't read it before, Autobiography of Alice B. Toklas, uh, which despite its title is really by and about Stein. We used it as a timeline, reading other works by Stein as she discusses them in the memoir and also looking at like her scientific studies, the growing art collection, um, and larger historical and cultural events that she was living through at the time. Our journey through Stein's work, biography, and posthumous reception was accompanied at every step by rare materials. So when we read about the work ten Tender Buttons in the autobiography, we also read some excerpts from Tender Buttons, and we looked at first and later editions of Tender Buttons. We took advantage of the incredible resources in Baltimore for understanding Stein and her peers. So the Cone Collection at the Baltimore Museum of Art, the Cone Papers at the BMA Library, and the Chesney Medical Archives for the Hopkins Hospital and the East Baltimore Schools, which has records of her student work. So a big thank you to Sarah Dansberger at the BMA Library and Nancy McCall and Andy Harrison at Chesney for hosting us. We made visits to all those places. 
However, we spent most of our time with Robert A. Wilson's collection right here at the Sheridan Libraries. I really should say a word about, about Robert A. Wilson before I turn things over. He was an undergraduate in the early 1940s in one of the classes that was accelerated through its coursework so that graduates could join the war effort as soon as possible. So he did that. And after his service, he joined the diplomatic corps. Um, he turned out not to love that work, um, but he eventually became the owner of a really fantastic, famous bookshop in uh, Greenwich Village called the Phoenix Bookshop. Um, this perch, you know, at a bookshop in, in the West Village gave him the perfect vantage point for acquiring new materials about Gertrude Stein, which was really his most beloved uh, collection. One of the signature features of his collection is that it contains not just first editions of all the books Stein published in her lifetime, but first editions that are inscribed to people in her circle. And that little bibliophile detail tells you a lot about Wilson. First of all, that he loved the pursuit, right, of, of book hunting, um, but also that he really cared about Stein's networks, her connections, the whole world she assembled around herself, as well as her writing. Um, so he collected, you know, rare books, manuscripts and letters, books about and inspired by Stein, commercial ephemera, like diaries and calendars, like you can see here, and even um, goofy souvenir artifacts, like the Stein Stein uh, on the slide. And, but the, the great thing about all of this is that it really helps us get into the inner workings of Stein's writing and is enormously illuminating about her, leg her legacy. Uh, there's a couple articles linked on the registration page for today's program that can provide more insight into Wilson's collection if you're interested. So our class really took advantage of these riches. Throughout the semester, even before they created their mini exhibits, the students delved into Wilson's collection and shared their observations on our public class blog, which is accessible through the URL on this slide. Okay, good. So now you, you know a little bit about what we were doing with this collection, what the collection is, and I'm gonna say a little bit about our presenters um, and then we'll go to them, the main event. Um, the order of presentations is roughly chronological, so each project focuses on a work that represents a distinct stage of Stein's career going from earliest to latest. Um, and these presentations also match up to the themes of our course, Stein is queer, Stein is a modernist, and Stein is a celebrity. Our first presenter is Lizzie Stamper, a senior majoring in history of science with minors in history and museums and society. And Lizzie's presentation focuses on an early Stein text called QED composed in about 1901 or 1902. Our next presenter is Alice Robertson, a senior majoring in history of art with a minor in museums and society. Her project examines the making of Americans Stein's giant modernist novel, which was written between 1908 and 1912, but not published for another decade. And finally, we'll hear from Jolie Garcia, a junior double majoring in physics and mathematics with a minor in museums and society, who examines Stein's opera, Four Saints and Three Acts, written in the late 1920s with music by Virgil Thompson, which premiered in 1934. Okay, so on to Lizzie. Perfect, thank you. So um, one theme that I traced through it was her identity as um, a queer icon and how that is largely posthumously placed upon her as many of the terms are not only modern, um, but also she never used them to describe herself. Um, in particular, QED offers um, special insight because she wrote it early in the 1900s, but it was not published until well after her death. And it tells the story of a lesbian love triangle that very closely mirrors one that she actually um, experienced herself while here at Hopkins. So something that really stood out to me and I'm sure all other students was that she actually went to Hopkins um, similarly to us. So that was very exciting to see, you know, one of the earliest female students, um, even though she was at the medical school, um, it still, you know, helped her feel a bit closer to me, I personally feel. Um, in particular, this photo of her, I find, you know, just very inspiring and slightly um, funny because you can see her very, you know, 
studiously posing for this photo with a skull um, just casually placed upon her desk as all Hopkins students do in the library. Um, however, um, one thing that's not shown in this photo is the time that she was going through um, outside of class and outside of her records that we did get to see at Chesney Medical Archives. Um, so outside um, of school, she was in a romantic love triangle involving May Bookstaver and Mabel Haynes, um, which direct influences can be seen in her later works and was essentially a plot, like plot map for her work, QED. Um, QED, while written in the first couple years of the 20th century, wasn't published until 1950 and actually um, was edited heavily by Alice B. Toklas. Um, we know that she wrote it in about the um, 1901 to 1903 um, as she was leaving Hopkins and moving to Europe with her brother. However, um, in the autobiography, she mentions a um, text that she put like wrote in one sitting almost and then put it in a drawer and never looked at it again until several decades later. Um, I personally believe that this was most likely QED, um, even though she doesn't name it. But as you can see, this book was not originally titled or was not published under the title of QED. It was published under Things As They Are, which was a title that um, either Alice or Carl Van Vechten, um, one of her close friends, um, chose to publish it under. But here we can see the introductory information in place of the publication information in this book that clearly states she wrote it in 1903, but it's being published for the first time um, from the manuscript owned by Carl Van Vechten and copyright of Alice B. Toklas. My third object that I investigated was a republication of QED, um, this time under its original name and in its original form. However, it was published with several other stories written by Stein, um, including Fernhurst. So while QED was um, a direct retelling of her situation in that love triangle in which she went through a deep depressive state as she was left on the outside of this triangle in the end, um, contemplating herself in the world after experiencing her first romantic relationship. She also wrote a um, heterosexual version of this in the title of Fernhurst, which actually placed the characters in a more academic setting, very similar to her time at Hopkins in while they were teachers at a um, boarding school in Fernhurst. But you can see her playing with this idea of, you know, her past experiences in multiple ways and drawing out different points, um, almost as if she's trying to understand or come to terms with her, you know, experience um, now that she's no longer at Hopkins and moved to Europe to pursue writing. So on this cover, you can clearly see um, two abstracted female forms with flowing hair, and this hints at the um, romantic lesbian stories within. On the back cover, there's actually a hidden third female form that when the cover is folded out completely and laid flat, it seems to be gazing upon the other two, and I just think that that's a very um, powerful image for what actually happened not only in her life but in QED. Um, QED, the novel, um, when reprinted, was printed in its original form and under its original name, standing for um, Quod Erat Demonstratum, forgive my Latin, um, which stands for which was to be demonstrated, which I also feel um, leans heavily into her time at Hopkins, because what's more Hopkins than using a mathematical term to describe one's love life? So I took a turn a bit on my last object and I looked at Stein as a modern queer icon and her reception because while um, she wrote these stories during her life, none of them were published until long um, after her death. And she's now known as a modern queer author. And this is shown through a lot of merchandise and commercialization of her image including the quotable notables that we have in our collection, which shows Gertrude Stein in an almost bookmark form with several stickers that relate to her, including you can see a little poodle that's, I believe, supposed to be her dog named Basket. 
um, possibly Basket too, um, another dog. And so she is shown here holding a book with her, you know, traditional clothing of a large, long flowing skirt and a large scarf. But in her hand, um, you can see a rose and a small locket, um, which actually has a photo of Alice B. Toklas, her long-term um, partner. While Stein is known as a queer icon, Alice B. Toklas is very hard to find in any merchandising of Stein. We know that she was, you know, essentially her wife, but we know very little about Alice um, in the like public commercialization version of Stein. Outside of the autobiography of Alice B. Toklas, she's very rarely mentioned as anything other than a roommate or a secretary, um, a very attentive secretary, but that's all that we see of her. Um, but I thought it was interesting how even in these modern representations of Stein as a queer icon, um, something that wouldn't have been able to happen unless Alice B. Toklas had published these stories after her death that were clearly of um, a lesbian romantic, you know, nature, she's not present within the representations other than small, subtle nods to um, her. And so I wanted to close um, on this photo of Gertrude and Alice because I think it perfectly sums up my takeaways in that Stein is at the forefront with Alice following closely behind um, smaller in the frame. This was actually a photo of the two of them taken at the same time. It's not edited as I originally thought, um, but you can see Alice smaller in the frame and it just reminds me of what I was just talking about, of Gertrude being shown as this modernist um, literary icon and a queer, you know, figure, while Alice, the woman who helped support and continue this um, identity of hers after her death and cultivated it essentially um, is smaller in the background and only vaguely hinted at throughout um, the uh, storylines. But yeah, that's my presentation. Perfect. And yes, thank you so much. All right. Um, thanks, Lizzie. So my presentation is on Stein's 925 page self proclaimed masterpiece called The Making of Americans, um, which has really seldom been regarded as the modernist classic that Stein herself considered it to be. Um, it never truly succeeded in establishing Stein's reputation as a genius writer, but instead sort of succeeded as more of a literary event. Um, because of its 925 page length, this presentation is not really about like the plot itself. I think I've only read maybe the first five pages, um, but I'm going to be looking at the inadvertent fate of this text through four objects from the Robert Wilson collection. So our first object is a first edition copy of the book. Um, and as you can see, noted on the cover, Stein wrote the entire novel in two years from 1906 to 1908, although the actual novel itself wasn't published until 1925. Stein wanted to make it very clear to readers that her modernist literary experiments predated those of her better known male contemporaries, such as James Joyce, whose novel Ulysses was published three years prior to Americans. Um, actually, in the autobiography of Alice B. Toklas, Stein describes the making of Americans as, quote, really the beginning of modern writing. Um, she had definitely a lot of conviction in her talent. Um, so in the copy we have here at Hopkins, all 925 pages are uncut, which means that the pages of text are like folded in on themselves, which was how it was sold. So whoever purchased the novel evidently felt no desire to actually read the words, at least in this copy. So it's preserved completely as it was sold. Um, the buyer understood that this work was important enough to purchase and preserve, but probably for, more for its historical value than for the actual content of its pages. Um, Yet collectors were not and had never been Stein's target audience. She really wanted more than anything to be read and to be read by the masses. Um, but by the end of 1926, only 74 of the 415 paper bound versions had been sold. Um, and it was, it was a massive financial loss for contact editions, the publisher. 
So in trying to reach a larger audience, um, an abridged French translation was published four years later by Editions de la Montagne. Um, it features a portrait of Stein done by her friend Christian Berard um, on the inside cover page. It's kind of hard to see here, but it is of Stein. Um, so this abridged version is only 104 pages, so about 10% of the original text. Um, but even in its abridged version, in this copy, the text remains unread. Like the pages are uncut as well in this copy. The words have never really seen the light of day. But about 17 years later in 1963, Americans was brought back to life through sound. So this LP features a passage from the novel as well as a lecture from Stein's Lectures in America slash plays um, that was recorded by Tony nominated actress, Marion Seldes. Um, as you can see, this vibrant red album sleeve it features a portrait of Stein done by Richard Banks, um, which you know obviously kind of helps to identify the record with the now somewhat iconic face of Gertrude Stein. Um, other recordings of the making of Americans did exist before Seldes performed her version, including a 1952 album that we also have in our collection. Um, but this new interpretation of Stein's modernist work demonstrates a continued interest in her literary achievements. However, the excerpt that Seldes recorded is only 20 minutes long, um, so enough for listeners to get a feel of Stein's prose, but not too much for them to tire of it. Um, so consumers wouldn't actually have to go out and buy the 1,000 page text if they had this nice little recording. So that brings us to our last object, which is actually three objects, and they are invitations to the 4th, 11th, and 12th annual marathon readings of The Making of Americans um, that was held at the Paula Cooper Gallery in New York City. The gallery started this tradition in 1974 and it lasted up until the year 2000. Um, the event would begin on New Year's Eve and would conclude on the 2nd of January. So these readings featured the voices of some of New York's most prominent um, artists and creatives, and the readers are included on the invitations to the 4th and the 11th annual readings. Notable names include writer Susan Sontag, composer Philip Glass, and the collector Robert A. Wilson. And because the readers were featured so prominently, they're kind of projected as the real draw to this event. I think kind of begs the question, would attendees come to actually hear Stein's work or to hear these New York celebrities' voices read them? It definitely seems unlikely that any single attendee would stay for the full 50 hours of the reading. Um, Thus, I think like all objects I've examined so far, the entire text of Americans was not the primary interest of the consumers. But, you know, having a distinct annual tradition that paid homage to Stein's work as an author definitely helped to create her legacy as a modernist icon and garnered recognition for the making of Americans as an important modernist work. However, still, the focus was not on the text itself as Gertrude always wanted it to be. Um, and interestingly, some groups today still hold marathon readings. So if you ever stumble across one, I I beg you to go. I would love to go. Um, it would be a really interesting time. Um, but yeah, that concludes the trajectory of the making of Americans. Thanks, Alice. Uh, so I have my project on Stein's libretto for Saints in Three Acts. And I'm be also exploring it through four different objects. So first, just some background on Four Scenes and Three Acts. It started out in 1927 when Stein wrote the libretto, and then she partnered up with Virgil Thompson and sent him the libretto, and he was able to set it to music. Um, he wrote a piano score and performed it for Stein, and she loved it. And so there was a development there. And then in 1934, uh, Four Scenes in Three Acts premiered uh, first in Hartford, Connecticut, and then later on Broadway, where at the time it held the title of the longest running opera, which is really impressive. And then just later on, after that original run, uh, there was a radio show, there were at least two that were aired where they would play Four Scenes in Three Acts. And there's still to this day new stagings just a couple of years ago, there was a one man performance of not singing, but just reading out the libretto. So there's still an appreciation for this work. So what I found to be the most effective way to communicate the progression of Four Saints and Three Acts through this timeline, um, through these objects 
would be one to have an object that is focusing on Stein's libretto on her work, then to have one that focuses on that adaptation from her uh, words that she wrote into that performance and into that more musical production. Uh, third, to talk about the original reception. So what people thought of her libretto um, of Four Saints and Three Acts right when it was performing, uh, when she was still alive. And then fourth, to talk about today's reception of the work, the legacy of her work. So for the first object, which is focusing just on her libretto, uh, I chose a proof of offers in place. So Stein was able to self-publish uh, offers in place, which was a collection of this libretto among other plays that she had written. And she published this in 1932 uh, through the Plain Editions, which was the self-publication that her and Alice had made together. And this was a smaller uh, batch of copies, so it wasn't as well received as audiences, audiences she wanted to reach. Uh, and this is really showing to how before she reached the height of her fame, Stein had to really rely on that circle that she had. A lot of other artists uh, that were local to Paris, um, especially. So what was very interesting about this particular copy of this proof is that there were postcards that were pasted inside the front pages uh, showing that she wasn't just kind of working alongside these people, but these were her friends that were helping her and they were all helping to let each other's art see the world. So the second object is going into how this libretto became an opera. And we can look at this manuscript of uh, from Virgil Thompson. It's in his handwriting and it is a single page. Um, what's interesting about this is that this is the only page that we found in the collection um, of this manuscript, which makes it seem like it's not from a whole collection. It might be just a single copy that was made. And this page of this manuscript does contain um, a pretty well-known part of this opera, um, a line that Gertrude Stein wrote, which was pigeons in the grass, alas. And there were some readings that we had too that mentioned that specific line. Um, What's really cool about this libretto is that even though this is a really popular work of Stein, it's one of her popular works where she didn't really tone down um, her unique language and a lot of what in her modernist works didn't might not have marketed well, might not have sold well, but she was still able to have that shown to show more her more quirky writing um, within this libretto. Um, but this is just a really good example of seeing how that adaptation happened. Uh, so the third object, which is talking about the original reception, we have a program from the original showings in Hartford of Four Saints and Three Acts. And what's interesting is among, like in addition to uh, the pictures of the cast, which a really fun fact about Four Saints and Three Acts is that it premiered and has traditionally been performed with an all black cast, which for happening in the 1930s is really, really progressive. Uh, and among that cast, we also had uh, pictures of Stein and Thompson, and it's pretty clear that she was a really big part of the marketing for this. So this wasn't just an opera, it was very much tied to her name, and it was tied to it being her work and her words that were inside of it. And inside of this program, they also had one of her portraits that she would write. So the same way that artists would make portraits, um, of her or of each other, she would have written portraits that she would make of people she worked with. So she had her portrait of Thompson and Virgil Thompson wrote a musical portrait of Stein, which was included in the program, which was really cool. And not something you would expect to see inside this type of program. And it was cool to see how it's so tied to the people who made it as well. So this final uh, object that I picked shows the reception that is more modern. So I was able to find within I mean, there was so much stuff in the collections. It was so fun to be able to work with them. And there was a box that had VHS tapes in them. And when I went through them, I was able to find a recording for a documentary about Four Saints and Three Acts. And there was also the newspaper ad that was cut out uh, about this documentary as well. And it turns out this documentary is based off of a book that was published and the author was able to have a documentary that would reach a larger audience. Uh, and it's fun because this is such like an ephemeral piece of like media uh, related to the works. Uh, and I was able to watch the documentary. Um, there's a 
a copy of it online. And it's very interesting because they were able to interview a lot of people who were in the original productions of Four Saints and Three Acts. They were able to interview scholars who have focused on Stein's work. And it's very interesting to compare that reception and how they're viewing the work to how it was originally viewed because a lot of people are focusing so much on Stein, on her words, on things like her queer identity that were not talked about in the 1930s when her work was first shown. And it's interesting to see that there's still such a big appreciation for this work, uh, for how it is a very digestible way to view modernist works without having to sit down and read a 900 page book. Instead, you could you know, listen to an opera, um, watch it, and you're still able to kind of feel it. And I think that has to do too with how well Thompson and Stein were able to work together on this project to convey a lot of what she's meaning, even if sometimes it's very hard to understand through that music. So thank you. Uh, the last slide should be the sources and other materials. Well done, you guys. Well done. And thanks for, uh, you know, um, in a moment, we will hear some questions from the audience. Um, and so those of you who are watching live, please go ahead and type your questions into the Hopkins at Home chat, and we will do our best to respond to as many as we can. Um, but I'm going to take the my opportunity to ask the first question. Um, so uh, Lizzie, Alice, and Jolie, um, we spent 14 weeks with those boxes uh, <laughs> and that big card of books. Um, what was it like to spend a semester digging into this collection? Um, you know, looking at those first editions, looking at editions, uh, some things outside the collection as well, right? First editions by works, uh, first editions of works by Stein's peers, all that crazy ephemera. I'm just trying to remind you of some of the cool things we looked at that maybe weren't on screen today, like his scrapbooks. Um, yeah, what what were what were your some of your like uh, responses to to digging into that collection. So um, for me, it was really exciting to get to interact with these materials every class period. Um, and it feels like every time you go, you know, into the archive or the collection, you find something new that you weren't expecting um, because there's just so much in each box. So one thing that I found that I just, you know, it was so exciting was we have this large box of different ephemera and merchandise based upon Stein, um, including, you know, little miniature artist books based upon her works, which are just so small and beautifully made to a interestingly designed um, pillow of Stein, um, which is just, it it startles you every time you open the box, even if you know it's going to be there. But I remember the first time opening that box and it was quite an experience, but yeah, that's one thing that stuck with me through working with the collection. Yeah, um, just to add on to that, I think it was really special, especially because, you know, I'm a senior, so nearly half of my college career has been like completely online. And so getting to be in these classes that actually deal with the archive and like getting to do hands-on stuff with it is just so exciting. Like every time touching a book and being like, oh my God, like Gertrude Stein, like actually touched this book, especially the stuff that's like inscribed by her. Um, yeah, like the thrill kind of never goes away. Yeah, I agree with everything I said. Uh... I mean, it's just a large collection. It was, I feel like every time you would find something new that you wouldn't be expecting, uh, even if you're comparing what's written online, if, if you're looking for something specific, then I feel like every time you would look for a specific object, you would find three other things that you were, you were also so excited to use uh, because it's such an expansive and like versatile collection. It was so much fun to be able to see it. Yeah, and it, I, I would just say it's, it's it's fun for me too. It's, uh you know, and the great thing about, um I mean, yeah, I, the thrill never goes away for me either, Alice. And it was especially fun being with the three of you every time because what you saw and noticed often like helped me see things in a new way. So it was, it was um exciting, even for objects that I had looked at many times before. Um. Thank you. Um, we've got some some questions coming in, and um, 
Bill asks, um, you know, who was Stein's target audience? Uh, not the general public, question mark. Any, um, any thoughts about that? I have some thoughts about that, but I'm curious what you guys think. Well, I, oh, well, I remember there's a quote that she wrote where she said she writes for herself and strangers. So I think in terms of who she was trying to reach, she wanted to appease herself with her writing, but I think she always dreamed of just having everyday type of people, students, people just picking up her books and being able to read it. So, which was kind of funny because a lot of times what she was writing was stuff that was very digestible to um, more highbrow audiences. And that's what she was writing among. And that's who a lot of her friends were. Uh, but she did say that she wanted to have a general audience. Yeah, just to like add on to that, I think she definitely wanted her books to be read by the general public by I think specifically like university students. Um, I'm trying to find I have this quote here from autobiography of Alice B. Toklas that says, Richard Stein's readers are writers, university students, librarians, and young people who have very little money. I don't know if that's actually true, considering um, what we know of like where her books actually got out to, um, but she definitely wanted to be widely read. Yeah, she was maybe a little bit um, not as well informed about the general reading public as, you know, maybe she might have been, but I, I think, you know, this was true for a lot of her peers as well, right? Um, sort of balancing the desire to um, be wet, to be read, to be known, uh, but also to sort of really pursue these these new ideas, which were not always as, as reader friendly as um, you know more traditional forms of literature. Yep. So they were they were existing in this tension. Um, Phoebe Stein has asked. Um, and this is a question specifically for Jolie, but Jolie, we can answer it together if you want. Uh, was the Hartford production of Four Saints and Three Acts, um, you know, it was in 1934, was signed in the U.S. for her book tour. So she gave a book tour in 1934 um, after the autobiography of Alice B. Toklas came out, you know, and she was suddenly like, everybody was talking about her and she was finally getting widely read right so she came to the U.S. she gave a book tour um and so was her did her book tour coincide with the Hartford production well I know Lizzie talked in one of her her blog posts that's on the class website about a photograph that we have of Stein at uh, the premiere for Four Saints in Three Acts so she was around for it and she was able to see it which is is very fun and I'm, I'm sure that was really awesome to be able to see during the height of her fame that her work was being appreciated, not just autobiography, which was something that she did create for a larger audience in mind uh, to have it more received, but to be able to see something that was closer to a lot of her earlier works and her more modernist works also succeeding was probably really fun for her to see. Yeah, adding on to that, as Jolie said, I got the chance to research more closely Stein's um, experience of actually getting to see the production. So she um, was able to see it premiere in Chicago um, later that year. So I believe the Hartford, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Julie, I believe the Hartford um, ran for the earlier part of the year, um, closer to February or March. Um, meanwhile, while she was touring the US, she was able to um, kind of cross paths with an opening in Chicago. I don't know if that was purposefully done, most likely, um, because she was there for opening night in November. Um, but yes, she was able to see it in Chicago. I don't believe she got to see it any other time. But yeah, there's some very interesting news articles about her showing up in Chicago um, and being the talk of the town. Yeah, and it's so, it was so great that we we had that photo. Um, that photo was complicated. Um, <laughs> um, and if anyone's interested in more about that, please please read Liz, Lizzie's article on our blog. Um, 
A couple of other questions. Uh, Jude wants to know, how can one access this collection in Baltimore? Great question. We in libraries love to talk about access. Um, so right now the collection is being reprocessed. That is archive speak for being reorganized. Um, and that's because when it was, when we, um, when we acquired it from Robert Wilson, um, it was processed, you know, in a kind of uh, expedient way that seemed suitable at the time. But now that we're preparing for an exhibition, you know, I realized uh, while, while working with the students that we we kind of needed to have a more granular uh, organization. And um, we've been very fortunate to have um, help from the program in museums and society to um, create a stipend for um, an archives intern to work on this project of reprocessing the collection. And that intern is Lizzie, <laughs> um, who has an interest in archival work going forward in her life. So we're reprocessing it right now, and then it will be um, uh, on display later this year with an opening in September. So please keep an eye out for that. Um, Parts of the collection may be available um, for public research uh, between now and then, but we'll, we'll sort of have to see how much we end up using in the exhibition. Um, I'm noticing that it is actually getting kind of late, so um, maybe it is a good time to wrap things up. Um, and, you know, I know there's a couple of the questions in the queue, and I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them. Um, I want to say especially thanks to Alice, Lizzie, and Jolie for being here today and also for their incredible uh, good humor and hard work last fall where um, I kind of thought we might like lose each other during the excerpts of Tender Buttons that we read, but <laughs> everybody persevered and um, was just a wonderful student, as you can see, right? Super um, insightful work and great research. Um, so thanks for taking the time today. I know your schedules are really packed. I also wanna thank everybody who tuned in today um, for our conversation. If you wanna share or rewatch this program, it will be on the Hopkins at Home website and the JHU YouTube page in the coming days. Um, of course, if you're interested in learning more about the rare books and manuscripts that we have in the Sheridan Libraries, please go to our website, www.library.jhu.edu. And um, thanks for being in here. Have a wonderful weekend.